So a second thing which I think is really important to communicate is that it's very difficult to ever put ourselves into the minds of different people. But if there's one thing which I think is really crucial to understanding this topic is to accept how diverse a continent Europe actually is. And when we're talking about kind of managing carnivores in Europe, there is not one place called Europe. Europe is, you know, what, 25, 30, 40 different countries with many languages and cultures and many, many individuals. So while we often as sort of conservationists focus on the ecological Europe, and we think about Europe as habitat for our wolves and lynx and bears, is also a habitat for 500 million people who have at least 500 million different ways of thinking about any topic. So really what I'm talking about here is trying to give an insight into some of this kind of diversity. And when you think, well, this doesn't make sense here in Italy, well, maybe it makes sense to somebody in Finland or Latvia or in Spain. Okay, so just try to open your minds to different perspectives and different points of view. Because really, if we don't get to grips with the understanding of diversity, we really have no way to achieve any type of coexistence. Um, when it comes to the question of I'm killing carnivores, probably the most important place to start is, well, why would you actually want to kill a carnivore? Right? And there are many, many aspects of this. Can the, one thing is that many people have very different values about how they value wildlife. Other people experience a conflicts. And then we have to understand there are many different types of conflict. If we're also talking about kind of justifying arm killing carnivores in order to bring down arm conflicts, we have to say, well, what are the mechanisms? How does it actually help a conflict to kill a carnivore? And then you ask, well, is um, a killing them actually compatible with a conservation? And a final question, well, is it actually legal? So to really to evaluate this question as to why kill carnivores, you really have to answer all of these on different questions. And the answer will also depend very much on who you actually ask. Right? If you're asking a conservationist, if you're asking a sheep farmer, if you're asking a hunter, if you're asking a bureaucrat, you'll probably get very different answers to this question. So what I'm going to try to do here is not so much to justify the arguments, but I'm going to try to give you some insight into the different arguments which are presented by different stakeholder groups. And for the last 30 years, we have done a lot of work in Europe on, on, on social science, where we've been studying people, talking to people about their attitudes, their beliefs, their ideas. And also we've worked through an awful lot of stakeholder workshops and processes and platforms, where we've had countless interactions with stakeholders. So the ideas I'm going to present here are not sort of my ideas, but these are the ideas which stakeholders are actually telling us, okay? Um, so if we take a first arm um, perspective here, the livestock producers perspective, the question is why would they choose to kill carnivores? And the argument here is obviously that sort of they believe that somehow by um, killing carnivores it will reduce the killing of livestock. And here there's two really very different uh, contexts. If you think about the context of say reindeer herding, in northern Norway, Sweden, or Finland, or even some of the Norwegian sheep farming where the sheep are roaming free without any guarding, then the number of animals killed by carnivores is directly linked to the population density of carnivores. If you have more bears, then more sheep die or more reindeer die. If you have less, then less die. And this is really only applicable in these very, very extensive grazing systems where there is minimal protection at livestock. But certainly here, there is a very clear link between the density of carnivores and losses. And you can, in a way, limit the density, or say, the, the number of sheep killed or reindeer killed by actually lowering that density of carnivores. So this is a thing that works in certain contexts. Luckily, most European livestock are not, are not kept in such a way. They're usually kept in some system that guards them, whether it's um, shepherds or dogs or il electric fences. And then, the relationship between the density of carnivores and sheep losses is not the same. It's not always um, directly linked. And here, the potential kind of logic of killing a carnivore to reduce losses is linked to kind of killing a problem individuals. 
to those individuals who display um, a knowledge of a way how do you get past the protection measures to actually get at livestock. Um, the newspaper article there comes from Northern Norway last week, where a lynx got into a barn over two or three nights and killed around 30 sheep. And this was a lynx really doing something very strange. It was going into the barn and killing a large number of sheep. And this really is not normal. And here you can say, great, we have a problem individual. And that lynx can have a shot, and you can certainly expect this will lead to less livestock being killed by that individual. So there's two very different kind of mechanisms here in two different places. But certainly, in some places, in some arguments, there may well be a logic to the fact that I'm killing carnivores, in some extent, will lower losses. But of course, all of us know that the main objective in conservation should be to better protect sheep, to actually stop the problem from happening. But in the context of, say, reindeer herding, for example, we don't have met any kind of mitigation measures here. So there, the only way to regulate losses is through regulating density. Moving on to the hunters. Hunters have sort of four um, conflicts with kind of large carnivores. First of all, they have a simple competition with carnivores kind of, kind of for prey. And again, this is a, a thing that varies hugely in, the, in a European context. In some countries, you're struggling with an overabundance of prey. Right? But in our northern and northeastern systems, the hunters really feel a competition. And that if a lynx or a wolf kills a prey, then that's one prey less. Um, and to a certain extent, they are right. And if you choose to manage this un a conflict, the only way is actually by managing the density of carnivores. Um, but probably the most important conflict that we have in Northern Europe is the killing of hunting dogs. And in terms of, of numbers, we're probably dealing with maybe 20, 30, 40 dogs every year, which doesn't sound like much. But when you think about the emotional component of a dog being killed, this really is the fuel which is driving an awful lot of a conflict in the North. And we still don't really fully understand the mechanism or the motivation of wolves to kill dogs. But certainly we do see that it's not evenly spread across the whole population. And certainly hunters argue that if they can take out certain individuals or packs who seem to have taken a habit of killing dogs, they believe, at least, that that conflict can be managed. Um, probably the hardest point of view to understand for non-hunters is probably the most important for hunters. And when we're arguing why kill carnivores, they would argue, why not? Right? And this depends a bit on how you view the correct relationship between humans and wildlife. For hunters, it's a normal thing to kill wildlife. That is how you express your value of wildlife. You value wildlife, you hunt it. And they think, well, why should a wolf or a lynx actually be anything different to a moose? So this is simply a point of view that we often kind of neglect, that we say, why? And they say, why not? And it's a very difficult kind of question to, to answer. And it just shows that often we do come from totally different points of view. It doesn't mean that we can't find some common ground, but often our starting point may be totally different. The final point of view from hunters is the point of view of economics. And certainly, in some relatively few contexts, there is quite a lot of money to be made for trophy hunting of bears, especially. It's not as if hunters are getting rich, but maybe this is enough to fund their wildlife kind of management activities at the hunting club level. Certainly, there is an economic thing here where they actually do attach a monetary value to carnivores, as opposed to the more abstract values that all of us attach to them. Um, one thing that we often forget in these uh, carnival conflicts when we focus on, the, on livestock herders or hunters is that there's actually a general public out there. And at least in, in, in Northern Europe, it's actually the reaction coming from the wider public, which is often some of the main driver of conflict. It's not people who are losing their hunting or people who are losing livestock, but it's people who are simply frightened. Wolves have kind of come back after 100 years of, of absence, and people are genuinely frightened. We can argue for days about, well, it's not rational, and we can talk about the probability of being killed by a wolf and the dangers from smoking and driving cars, but it doesn't change the fact that many people are genuinely scared. One of the arguments which is often raised here is, well, does hunting carnivores actually keep them shy? And it's what um, Ilka was kind of talking about. And largely, we don't know. We simply don't have an answer here, right? It's a thing where we don't understand it, um, and it's awfully complicated because we have the learning aspect, we have a genetic aspect. 
And to us, at least, it's a question that we should actually work on. But for people out there, this is simply a thing which they talk about. So when they are asking for carnivores aren't to be killed, it's often motivated by this desire to have shy animals, which they hope will lead to a greater safety. Again, it's not a rational thing, it's not an objective thing, but it's a feeling. And as all of us know, feelings can be very strong. Emotions are important. One of the probably least controversial aspects of arm killing carnivores is when you have these emergency situations. Okay? Uh, sometimes bears do kill people. And then it's not really a um, strange thing to ask that that bear should actually be killed. We have lots of cases where animals are suffering, um, animals are hit by cars, and then to kill them is pretty much a sort of um, a standard animal welfare thing to end a suffering. And we have the hybrid issue, which we heard about this morning, which again, it may sound simple, but in practice it can be awfully complicated. But still, these are the very certain issues where it's probably less controversial to actually kill animals. Um, but probably the most important and the most complicated thing here is linked to power. And th this is the, the field where the social scientists have been trying to explain to us ecologists for years about how society works and how people work. And often trying to explain that our focus on all these dead sheep and dead dogs in conflicts really is not important. That they say that the conflict is about almost everything else. It's about power. And it's about the power or the position of rural life in the face of change. Because the world is changing. We're in the force of, kind of, kind of um, urbanization. The um, people are, are moving from the rural areas into our cities. The values are changing. The culture is changing. Everything is changing. And a, a lot of people out there feel that this is a threat. Their whole history, culture, way of life is changing. And the wolf and bears, probably to a, a lesser extent, become symbols of that change. So actually, the simple fight over can we kill a wolf or not is not really about kind of killing that wolf, but it's about power. It's about who decides. Right? Is, it, is the power staying in the local area, or is it the power in the capital city, or is the power in Brussels? So really, it's, 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 it's about symbols. But these seem to be some of the really big drivers of conflict. And the, most of these demands to kill things are actually about power. Who gets to decide? Can somebody from outside say what's happening? locally here. Um, so in other words, what I hope you will take home from kind of this part is that there are many, many arguments which are being raised. So this whole discussion about can we kill a carnivore is coming, it's actually 10 or 20 different questions with different people are expressing different ideas behind it with totally different desires. Is there evidence to support it if um, killing a carnivore helps? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, so I'm not trying to judge it, but I'm just saying these are what people are, are, are talking about. And often these are questions which maybe don't have an answer, right? They're questions about values. And values are not right or wrong, they're simply different. The hunter says, why not? You can't argue with that. It isn't an answer to that question. It simply is a different point of view. And the question is, to what extent are we able to accommodate different people who have totally different points of view? Um, one of the main criteria, of course, here is the conservation impact. Is killing carnivores compatible with their conservation? And the first point here depends totally where you are. If you're in Sweden, you have a bear population of maybe 2,700 bears, it doesn't have a conservation conflict or a problem if you kill one or 200 every year. If you are in Abruzzo with bears less than 100, then every bear is crucially important, and of course you can't kill things. Right, so context is everything. But kind of carnivores are hunted in many countries in Europe, like the wolves are hunted, maybe 12 or 13 different countries, and so on. And across Europe, we have a lot of experience, both good experience and bad experience, at how to harvest carnivores or how not to harvest carnivores. So from that experience, it is not technically problematic to design a, a hunting system or a control system for large carnivores if you wish to. So it doesn't have to, to create a conflict with a conservation. So this is not really a technical issue. It's really a, a social issue. It's a cultural issue, right? Is it acceptable to hunt or to kill carnivores? And this depends totally on your point of view. From a conservation side, protection is not the same thing as a conservation. Protection is a tool that you can use 
in certain contexts to achieve conservation. But conservation does not require it. It's a purely a social issue on if you want to achieve protection and if you want to achieve conservation. But they don't have to be the same thing. We see a lot of the current protest about carnivore control is very much often motivated by um, animal welfare and animal rights issues. Like the, the protests in France, for example, over the killing of a relatively small number of wolves are not about a conservation issue. They're about simply an animal rights issue. And many people, and it's obviously very easy to understand people who care very deeply about carnivores. But the problem with some of these animal rights debates is that there's a, sort of a slope here. And one thing is to care about some individuals being shot now. But if you take this to the extreme point of view, for example, you risk ending up in places like um, um, Peta, who are one of the main animal rights groups, especially in the US, and they actually oppose the reintroduction of large carnivores because large carnivores kill ungulates. And then having a, a carnivore back is actually interfering with the rights of the prey. So they actually end up opposing carnivore conservation. So it gets very complicated if you start drifting very far into those arguments. But it's where a lot of um, people are, and these are issues that we really have to take seriously. And the relationship between animal welfare and rights and conservation is something that we really need to address much more. Um, a killing carnivores is also highly controversial among conservation professionals. So can, the, can we've done some questionnaire surveys among, I think, 500 different um, uh, conservationists? And they agreed on pretty much everything apart from the issue of killing carnivores. So this is not only controversial with a wider public, it's also highly controversial within our profession. The final constraint on this issue is law. And Ari gave us sort of some insights into the complexity of uh, our European law. Um, I, I'm not going to go back over to what he says, but there's a couple of points which I think have to come across here. And that because the annexes and appendixes of the Berne Convention and the, the Habitat Directive do have different categories, that is sort of a recognition that there is not a goal to prevent the killing of all individuals. That these are conservation tools. They're not protection tools. And the same goes for pretty much all of the international conservation legislation. All of it is basically focused on conservation of populations, where protection is simply one of many tools which has a place, but it's not the same thing, and they don't have the goal of actually protecting everything. The Council of Europe has a hunting charter, which kind of recognizes the value of hunting, for example. Um, but despite this fact that th these kind of legal instruments are not intended to prevent the killing of all individuals. They do place an awful lot of um, constraints on the freedom that countries have, especially in places where they are actually strictly protected. Um, and here, you certainly have at least four things which have to be demonstrated if you're going to uh, unkill carnivores. One is that you cannot escape from your obligation to achieve a conservation outcome. You certainly have to act in a way which is kind of proportional. So to kill a few is much, much easier to defend than killing a lot. There also has to be a demonstration of u utility. And this is where it comes back to the first part of my talk, because a lot of these proposals for how un unkilling carnivals helps are not actually documented. They're claims, they're beliefs, they're demands. They may be true or maybe not, but they're very difficult to actually prove. And certainly I think we have a job here as scientists to really document how much some of these claims made by stakeholders actually hold water and, or which ones don't. A final thing is there has to be no satisfactory alternative. And this depends a bit on which conflict you're talking about. Because if you're talking about sheep, well, we know there are many, many alternatives on how to protect sheep. Like, think of these 80 life and projects which have been spent on large carnivores. I guess maybe three quarters have involved some component of how to protect sheep. So we know a lot about how to protect sheep. So there, there are many, many satisfactory alternatives. When it comes, say, to reindeer herding, it's much harder. There we have almost no alternatives. And then the question is, what about the other conflicts? What about these conflicts of fear, these conflicts over values, these conflicts over power? Are these actually recognized as conflicts? Does the Habitat Directive or the Berne Convention actually recognize fear, anxiety, and power in society as a conflict? Or is a conflict only a dead sheep? 
a social scientist can tell us the most important driver of conflict is social conflicts. The dead sheep are simply symbols that look great on the front page of a newspaper, but the underlying causes are about power and society. So should we use killing a carnivores as a tool to address these issues if it helps? It is very much an open question for which there is no answer at the moment. So, yeah, so the, uh, un uh, the unanswered questions here. Can we recognize our social conflicts as conflicts? The other thing is what is public interest? Okay, which public are we actually talking about? Because public is very scale dependent. If you go into a mountain village where, say, most people are farmers or hunters, that'll, that public will have a totally different point of view of if you go to the village uh, uh, and down the road or if you go to the capital of the province, or if you go to the nation's capital, or if you go to Europe as a whole. So depending on which scale you look at the problem, the publics will have totally different points of view. So which public are we actually going to listen to? Which public gets to the side where we draw the lines here? And again, this is a question that does not have an answer, but it is a very much an important question. Which public should actually decide, or which public should say how much in any debate? Um, we spent quite a bit of time working on legal issues, so if you really care, you can dig into some of the legal aspects here, but that's not really the point here. What is important is that this issue of killing large carnivores is, is a whole pile of very, very complex questions. Okay, There are technical questions, there are ecological questions, the social questions, moral questions, and legal questions. And you cannot treat this fairly without treating all of these issues at the same time. Um, plus, the answer in one place will be a totally different thing to the answer in a different place. An answer which is, say, relevant for Estonia may not work in Luxembourg. Italy may work for Italy, or who knows, but it, it won't work elsewhere. So we have to have local solutions to the extent that we can do. And it's really a question of being pragmatic over being principled. And Kanaluji this morning was talking about this question of, well, should we have carnivores over wide areas, maybe at lower density, or should we concentrate them? And this is really where it comes to being kind of pragmatic or not. Okay? What do we actually want to do to achieve a long-term and sustainable coexistence? Um, then the question is, well, what do we actually mean by this term coexistence? Okay? And probably at the heart of it, it means what type of relationship do we actually want to have with wildlife? Is wildlife something that we look at? Is wildlife something that we interact with, maybe through hunting or not? Or is wildlife something that we simply choose not to have at all? There's many different kind of relationships between people and wildlife, and we really have to decide what type of relationship do we want to have. The other part here is that we talk the whole time about human wildlife and coexistence. But a very large part of these conflicts requires us to look at, well, human, human uh, and coexistence, because humans are not one thing, right? We're many different people, different publics, different stakeholder groups, different interests, and all of us probably have different points of view over how we would like that relationship with wildlife to be. So in other words, what we have to find is how do we as a society balance different groups of people who have very different interests? Do we simply put it to the vote, and if you get 51%, then you win, and the 49% lose? Or do we give a certain power to the minorities? But then the question is, well, do we let a minority dictate to the majority what to do? And this question of the balancing of power between minorities and the majorities is really at the heart of how we want our, our democracies to work. And this is not a simple question, but this is really where it's going. So these questions about can we um, um, kill a wolf or not actually touch on issues related to how do we want our democracies to work? How do we deal with diversity? And these are not simple questions. Um, so really that's where this talk has come to. That these are really important questions, but they are not simple ones. And I would challenge almost anybody to actually come up with a simple answer to these questions. Because if you do come up with a simple answer, then you really haven't understood the complexity of the question being asked. Thank you.